Well, it's a very big pleasure to be here today and to vi visit Ireland for, for the first time for me. And I've been impressed with the uh, team's work that they've done early, earlier this week, and we're, we're all going to review later today. Well, what I'd like to do t t today is uh, talk, talk about where we're coming from and where we're going in terms of building information modeling I I IT. I view building information modeling as process change. It's not a, a single tool. It's, it's not using Revit or BIM or any, any other single product. It's affecting the workflows, ch changing how we do things. And we're undergoing a transformation, really, in the basis of the way we represent data and the way we share it. So a good way to deal with that is for the younger people, they probably don't know how we worked in the past. The older people with gray hair, like myself, remember all these frustrations and challenges. Design did build as a delivery method, where somebody designs a building, and then they figure out how it's built later on. That worked well when we had standards of practice that everybody knew. It was a cultural knowledge about how buildings went together, and it didn't have to be specified because the people on the construction site already knew the details because they were standard. But of course, we moved out of that. We have explicit in instructions now about fabrication and detailing that weren't in old drawings in the early 20th century. And uh, of course, drawing-based development, the primitives are lines and circles of arcs and text, and that uh, was basically un unintelligible information from what we're doing today and then. 2D projections, inherent limitations. Yes, as long as things are orthogonal, we can design things well, or you leave, left it up to the innovation of the people on the con construction site. These were all standard practice. This, this is the way we operated. I, I saw major buildings built with a dozen drawings, and everything else was filled in by the craftsmen on the con con construction site. We had separate representations. We still had separate representations on, on the construction site. In, in general, a series of drawings, plans, sections, elevation, and anybody who's successful in the construction business has to be able to integrate those things in his head and figure out how it really goes together. And I, I, we've done some studies on the cognition of 3D models, and uh, only about a third of the people really can do that well in their head. Many of them become contractors or architects, but uh, Usually the owners and of sites and the clients can't do that. And so we, we do renderings, but they, they have been separate from the actual uh, construction documentation. Fabrication planning and design to build comes after the design. So if the contract drawings aren't right, you end up redoing them. In the US, we had general practice where contractors would redo the drawings little known, not to scale uh, on construction documents. It's very common because they go back and change the dimensions of things and not change the drawing because it's too arduous to do. We had many, many negative practices in, in the construction in, in, in industry before BIM came along. BIM is am, ameliorating these issues. When I apprenticed in an architectural firm, my job was to find conflicts using light table overlays. So I could see, but they were all orthogonal drawings. You have a, a roof drain or something like that that obviously is sloping to, to, to drain, and you, you didn't know exactly where it was. You'd have to work out, do little sketches, and figure out where, where those things really were in 3D space. And of course, some contractors would bid low on a project because they know that there are errors and omissions and make up their fee on errors and omissions. It was an adversarial relationship instead of collaborative working together for a common purpose. And then there were some productivity analysis on construction projects, particularly by the, uh, the Construction Industry Institute in, in, in Texas that showed that about 
45 or 50 percent of the time of a construction work on a construction site was either getting some tools and equipment or waiting around for things to happen. We have lots of room for productivity improvements, uh, lots of room for, for, for enhancements. Because of all the uncertainty in construction, slack time was built in the most tasks. People were concerned about starting late, so they put in more time so that they could catch up, and the whole schedule process was inefficient. And then, of course, design drawings were too arduous to keep up to date, so they make as built with maybe sketches and things but we really were not getting as-built drive. And of course, that's still a challenge today. As-built models are very hard to produce and not, not, not very common. But of course, I think we'll solve that problem soon. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention is because of the slow pace of construction, uh, both, both on the contractor side, but especially on the client side, in fact, I've heard contractors say, well, we're doing reinforced concrete. We can change these up to the last day. That is bad practice. But, uh, but so, so sometimes that's organized. And the slow construction time especially leads to under, under costing the cost of change based on a really efficient process. So this is where we're coming from, and this is where we're leading. Uh, to move to, to a, a whole set of better activities, which we'll talk about later today. So, what's the fundamental be benefits of BIM? I think you all know that. That's why you're here. A sing at one level, a, a single 3D model for design coordination, for doing counts and quantities. Uh, machine readability, re machine readability to both interrogate the data and for automatic detailing. We have both, lots of examples of both of those at this point in time. Uh, having virtual objects that you can count, you can quantify, you can order, you can check which ones have been ordered, which ones are on site, which ones are waiting to be on site, the status information. And we were learning about semantics. I think at the beginning when BIM got started, people thought that you could represent a wall once and that would be sufficient for everything. But now we realize we need different views of, of, of a wall for energy, acoustics, constructability. So there isn't a single model that's going to represent everything. We need a federated set of models for different purposes. And last but not least, garbage in, garbage out. Of course, everybody's familiar with that, that terminology. But the question is, what is the correct model? And I think we're still learning that. Architects, of course, are castigated because they're, they're exploring lots of alternatives and models tend to be a, a bit messy. H handover issues are a problem. Sometimes contractors trust the architect's model, but more often they, 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 they don't. And they re re often rebuild the model. Yep, we're generating a new set of issues and practices that are waiting to be solved. Why, however, were we in this situation? Electronics was, of course, the fastest with miniaturization. And of course, what the uh, Intel production plan is, is very much involved in on their side. And the man manufacturing was well, uh, just a little bit behind. And the construction industry is now just doing the take up on virtual design and production. And then we could have a whole workshop on the rationale of why construction industry was so big, so slow, Fra fragmentation, lack of technology sophistication, no one large company able to, to drive the technological changes that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, just a note, in the 1970s, there was a conference called the Design Automation Workshop put on by the IEEE Institute for, for Electrical and Electronic Engineering in the US. In those early conferences, they had sections on manufacturing, on electronics, on, uh, on, on architecture and construction. 
Notice at the beginning of this chart, everyone was at the same level. The first uh, CAD systems had GIS versions, they had chip versions, they were still drafting oriented, but they split off very quickly. Only architecture and construction stayed with the 2D representations for a long time. Standard of practice but just couldn't make that transition. And there's several histories of the adoption of CAD and BIM. And I think the definitive history still remains to be done. In about 1984, 1985, the Design Automation Workshop went totally to electronics. The issue of design automation electronics was so big that it drowned out the construction participation in, in those countries. Manufacturing stayed a little bit longer, and they, they, they split off on their own also. Here's a, a fairly famous chart representing productivity, labor productivity. How much do you produce for a man hour or man day of, of labor? And improvements in manufacturing have been constant and, and telling, and maybe that's one of the reflections of those earlier charts. Construction industry, it's a debate whether it's been declining in the U.S. or holding steady. And uh, Raphael Sachs and I have written several papers on, on, on these issues. It's not as bad as it looks. That's the bottom line. Well, the bottom line is, what do you consider manufacturing? What do you consider construction? Construction in the U.S. is labeled all those things that take place on site. So precast concrete, steel fabrication, are all classified as manufacturing activities. So that really skews these charts in, in, in a very significant way. But on this slow take-up, has it really been as slow as, uh, uh, as I indicated? There's been lots of automation taking place. Pipe cutting and threading, old technology, but it started in the early 1980s. Ductwork and sheet metal fabrication. I saw a water jet uh, cutting machine in the early 1980s. Uh, uh, break down, knock down cabinets. You're all familiar with them. We have home improvement places and you buy a box full of the pieces and assemble it yourself. And of course, in the US, we had Planetware and Cabinet Works and uh, other CAD CAD systems. If you could des uh, design your kitchen in a home improvement center, and two weeks later, you could get all the assembled pieces to, to, to put it together. They, they actually were quite early. I was really astounded when I saw that in production in Los Angeles. And, of course, and then seal fabrication, of course, picked up on the manufacturing side. These are Tekla drawing models, along with the photographs showing the, the real world representation as well as the model representation. All of these happened very early. So, so what we, we tend to think of construction from the top life cycle of building programming and architectural design, and engineering, contraction. But in fact, there's vertical submarkets in, in this. The vertical submarkets being site work, steel fabrication, precast concrete, cabinet work, and these of our vertical chains had, had early automation. They viewed themselves more on the man, manufacturing front than the construction front and took advantage of the technologies in, industry by industry. So in fact, what's happened in BIM is this percolating up from the specialization to the overall integration side. So let me talk a little bit about my view of stages of the, the, the development of building information modeling. The first thing you really have to do when you go to building information modeling is to be able to produce documents and drawings. And so producing drawings out of a single integrated model is, is an initial challenge. And of course, you get a consistent set of drawings that way. We did a little study a few years ago looking at how many times did you draw a detail in AutoCAD or some measurement. It was, it was an average of at least three times. Draw in plan, section, maybe a sectional view. So if you made a change later on in, in deciding it became very expensive, 
because if you remember the bomb, you had to make that ch change and update on every section and every view that, 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 that you had produced. And then inevitably, you get a phone call or stop and get some coffee or, or something, and likely to forget one of those updates. And that, now, now you've got an inconsistent set of drawings, and a change order can come along and catch you. You're going to pay for it later on, and the construction owner is going to pay for it. And then, of course, because everybody, few people can really read construction documents. It's really a challenge, and you have to study them all, and the client hardly ever can read them other than the floor plan. So uh, the 3D model that we have in building information really facilitates coordination. But these are the three kind of basic payoffs. You start using them, you, you have the, these benefits. And of course, class detection is a big financial benefit that's been picked up by all the firms that have been on the construction side. So after you get these basics, I think the second level of benefits is look, look at using Celebi or a similar kind of tool on the road checking. So SMC is Celebi model checker, and Celebi does a very good job for a limited set of of rule checking, okay. uh, accessibility requirements, spatial conflict checking, fire exiting. They ha have a variety of set, and, and, and this list is about a, a year old. It's, it's much bigger than it is now. And there's other companies that are doing rule checking. And there's a lot of effort going on right now to, de to develop very broad based uh, query systems that can do checking on a wide variety of things. It's very desirable for owners that they have requirements, for example, for hospital planning and design, and for uh, contractors, for standards of practice, or simplifying rationalization of, of, of pr 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 production. So I think we'll see, I, I view rule checking as something that's almost uh, a requirement for, for BIM modeling. Stage three begins to look at the integration between uh, the, the design part and the modeling part and the real actual construction. We're beginning to see uh, examples for solar radiation, some energy uh, ana analysis, uh, other kinds of uh, assessments where the architect has a dashboard that can very quickly see the effects of his design changes. We're trying to change the education of architectural students so they start thinking in this way that they can rely on quantitative tools. It's a slow process. Fabrication of partial pre-assembly. We have precast concrete plants where each piece is laid out with radio scanning overhead. Here. where pick control points let, and let, 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 let them out. We're seeing more and more examples of, of prefabrication and, uh, and pre-assembly, and I think that's, this is going to expand. It's obviously facilitated by 3D modeling and BIM, uh, and, but I, and I think it's going to lead to larger sets of changes about supply chain management, what's fabricated, what's, what, what's moved, What's the whole tra transportation system that moves between part different levels of, uh, of assembly? We're in that business in the same way that the aerospace industry is, but we'll, we treat it in a very different way. And uh, uh, of course, the design, the, the design to the model uh, objective is to use the model as, as control for coordinate points, the, the little red circle on the, on the uh, uh, picture on the, uh, on, on the right is from the Denver Art Museum where they have no vertical walls. So all the lintels and things had to be laid out by laser scan just so things would size and look completely. We're going to do more of that, not just because of the architecture of the building, but for better control. The four stages of BIM, we start using laser scanning to control the layout more and more. I, th I think uh, 
relationships between major scanning companies like Tatpa and, and the architect and contractor. We have to find better ways of the, the dimension and layout, take advantage of the lately laser scan, and then build to the model is a, is a grand objective. And with the total station kind of technology, we can now point to a place on the, in the model, get the same point in the building, and start using that to guide construction. So those ideas kind of stages that are all achievable today, the tools are there. And then there's future BIM where things are not quite so well defined. We're still learning how, how to accomplish them. I come back to the point of point dimension and control of tolerances at the boundary systems between different systems. If I have a facade that's both masonry and curtain wall, I'm bound to have challenges at, at, at the interface. But those kinds of things aren't going to go away, but how to manage them and control them. I get a lot of contacts from, from my, my digital building lab about these kinds of issues. It's very large contractors who have lots of experience, uh, but they're still using... We're, we're still looking at a set of drawings as, as the way we looked at them 25 or 30 years ago, and, and they really didn't take him to, to, to account the controls that we have with laser scanning so we can better, better manage the interface between systems that we need to. At least that's a problem in the, in the US. I, I assume it's a worldwide problem. I think we're very soon close to the point of having automatic class detection. Right now, we don't have quite the logic in our model to say, well, the rebar is supposed to be clashing with the concrete because we're not going to subtract out the space where the rebar is, it's double, double modeling. And, and so there's, a, uh, there, there's discussions in the ISC about uh, classifying, classifying models that are supposed to overlap parts and objects and which ones aren't. We're going to sort this out so that we can automatic class check every time you store your file to a server. <coughs> Model storing in Formwork, I, I saw some examples here in, the, in, in, the, in uh, Ireland. May, maybe you're further along and what we are in, in the US. But most of the modeling tools today are set up for static. Sure, you can come back and incrementally build the building using 4D simulation. But can I take things out and schedule the relocation of them? There are, that software doesn't quite exist in the US at this point in time. Uh, virtual mockups. We spent a lot of money on the construction site building a couple uh, story facade to check out the assembly, the detailing maybe do some engineering and now analysis. But to move to virtual mockups, I think, will we'll cut down the need for these and may, may, maybe, in some cases, they'll disappear. The, the field testing for water penetration and things like that, it's going to take a while to do, do that with uh, confidence. Expert system constructability rule checker, I think, Different construction companies will, once we have a slight improvement in the tools on doing queries, then we can do, do checks on those queries. And we can develop our own rule sets. I, I, I see uh, query systems and, and, and rule sets as being a fundamental technology that we have to grow and build into the tools. 4D safety checking, we've got examples of that. You know, barriers on, on the edge of slabs or edge of holes with, it, with an opening. That, that's coming along quickly, and that's, I think we'll see products doing that very, very soon. A little bit longer, I, I think the tolerance and, and dimensioning system will have to be integrated, have to get, get integrated in the tools and, the, and as well as the user's perceptions. The query and checking systems, I think we're going to see a big growth in that, so that we can build better models and we can validate that those, those models are better. I, th I think the UK goals of, of, the, of the work plan layout will, will help that along, but I think we, we need to expand that. I, I think in the US, even on private projects, we've got delivery systems and handovers. We'll have tests to validate, is all the data required 
that hand over actually in place. That, that's going to go on. It's going to be a bigger challenge, I think, for the UK government than they realize. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Uh, of course, we have tablet based uh, re review and field activities. But as BIM moves to the cloud, we'll be able to do really full scale work. Our, 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 our desktop systems are going to disappear. I, I, I think the, uh, the, the Microsoft Surface Pro is a good example. They're, they're kind of expensive right now, but you can do everything you, on that tablet that you can do, 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 do on a desktop. And, and of course, dashboard feedback on design and, and maybe construction pro pro progress also. I think we'll see more and more day by day uh, uh, tra tracking of these activities and doing checking. We're going into another phase of practices. It's interesting that 25 years is about the same as a generation of people going through the system. And so, of course, we're looking for the younger generation to lead in supporting all these changes. So, optimized searches for standard design operation. Uh, I think that, that will be a, a growing area for. Uh, optimizing the d design, simplifying connections, for example, things, things like that. So, who are the challenge? Who who are the drivers and who are the challengers uh, for these process changes? Of course, owners are, are critical. They're the ultimate beneficiaries. In the short term, uh, contractors or architects can gain advantage, but when everybody else has start using them, then then they kind of wash out and. and bounce out and they're all working from a different plateau. The architects, contractors, subcontractors in some sense are the anchors. I call them the anchors because they can drag. They can. And, and of course the pickup and, and uh, adoption of BIM and other IT te te technologies. They're, it's new, it's untested. We're quite familiar in the construction industry thinking about kind of 20 or 40 year life cycles. How do I evaluate this tool that's only existed for five years? It's a different mindset. We have to think in different ways about, about the technology that we're using. And it's very different from the technology we put into our building. And of course, the banks, we have, we've had some interesting, we've had a couple of court cases now on BIM adoption versus non-BIM adoption. And in New York City, there was uh, a, a lawsuit for over a million dollars where the uh, architect laid out spaces and, and the mechanical co contractor laid out space planning for a, the mechanical equipment in, a, in, a, in an office building that was converted into a hospital and, and the uh, um, NAP contractor, or excuse me, the mechanical engineers uh, laid out the, the, the duct, duct work and piping and everything in the seeds and it all worked. And the co contractor came along who didn't do BIM, did it the traditional way, doing it layer by layer by layer, ran out of space, sued and said it was undoable. The court said BIM was the state of, the, of best practice and they lost the suit, the, the contractor lost the suit because uh, he wasn't using the best state of the practice. That's an incentive, right? That's an incentive to use the uh, on the NAP side of the world uh, in particular. So uh, let me start by just, or end here by just noting, we're going through a revolution. 20 years ago, did it like they you know, use the same practices and technologies as 100 years ago, and you can go all the way back to Vitruvius. Uh, as the first engineer and architect. When the culture changes, some of you can pick it up and take advantage of it and, 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 and you benefit. And others will fight it off in the same way that we all use geodesy and, and GPS systems after navigation. And some people just refuse and, 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 and use maps in the old-fashioned way. Eventually, maps will become historical artifacts. 
if I show you a map of the world on my, uh, on my phone. So those kind of revolutions are, are taking place, and some people will take advantage of that and make something, uh, other people won't. Revolutions are times of creation. So thank you very much. I, it's going to be a wonderful workshop today. So the Mitchell Willing Lab has a, actually we have a 14 sponsor, not 12. 14. Yeah, it keeps going. It goes up and down a little bit also. And uh, so, so they, they, they sponsor the lab, they make between ten and fifty thousand dollars a year for different levels of collaboration. And that money is then used to fund research projects of their interest by, by faculty in, in the colleges of architecture and civil engineering, some me mechanical engineering. But this guy, because it's treated as not proprietary research, but public research, everything is in the public domain. So at, at this, this level of work, we all collaborate and, and it's open. I should say that we have a larger research program that's proprietary. Can I get some money for the, for the, for the contractor or architectural or something like that? material supply firm that, that, that we're, we're working with. So we have both levels. Usually the seed grants of, of the public domain start off, and some uh, uh, out of that work we get have very exciting uh, results, and that leads to a proprietary re research project most of the time. Some of them are very industry-wide, like these whole issues of, of dimensioning and quality control and, and We've got some students working on tolerance and stuff now in the construction and, 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 and before I take the first question from the floor, are you actually do you think this is going to enable the broader development of collaborative working as opposed to adverse area working? I think the culture in the US is moving very positively in the in the construction industry. There's been enough publicity about the adversarial role that I think it's initiating a, a lot, lot of progress on its own. IPD, Integrated Project Delivery, is a contractual firm that not very many people are actually using real IPD because it's very demanding. But on the other hand, there's something called IPD light kind of approximation, and there's a lot of companies doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, the dog. Thank you. Hi, Chuck. Thank you for the great to meet you on the site during the week. Um, just then, when you spoke about the revolution in your short time here in Ireland, do you see much evidence of a revolution here happening in Ireland with construction? And how does it compare to your experience in the US, uh, in the US as it stands today? I, I didn't pick up what the question was. So, from uh, your, in your speech or in your presentation, you're talking about the revolution in construction that we're, the journey that we're on. Have you seen much evidence of that since in your short time here in Ireland? And how does it compare to the US uh, today? Well, I think the projects that are going to be presented later today are very innovative and, and, and re 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 revolutionary. They're moving a step forward. I think the construction industry for a long time thought land acquisition and finance was, were the real beneficiaries of, of, of doing business. So they re really view themselves how to reduce risk, how, 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 how to deal with issues of financing, with where the benefits and profitability of a firm's were. So they weren't used to doing technology at that, unless it was the earth moving equipment or something very large like that. So the information technology, I think, was something that kind of blindsided the whole construction industry. And in a sense, that's a rationalization why the pickup was so slow. But I, I think it's really it's taken off now, and I think we'll, we'll see a lot of innovation. And hopefully, we're attracting IT savvy students coming into the industry, and do this is an exciting place to operate. That hasn't been the case for a few years. 
So I think the sessions we'll see today are good, good examples of, uh, of that. Ms. Webby? Yes. Thank you. It's a fantastic presentation. <clears throat> uh, honored to meet you. Um, my question is, should schools of architecture and engineering be teaching coding or should, you, or should companies in construction and design be employing um, sort of IT people really? Should, should, the, uh, yeah, should technology be part of the education of the construction? Technology is part of our world, right? We, we all have iPhones, we're, 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 we're tweeting, we're sending images across from the field back to the office. Here, here's a problem. Jerry, please take care of it. Let, 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 let me ha ha know how, how to do this detail. It's part of the practice. We're just really formalizing and structuring it. Now, should, uh, engineering students and, and architecture students be proficient in coding. There's levels of coding. I use Navisworks. I turn things on and off. I click buttons. I, I use it in a particular way. Uh, a lot, lot of students in architecture in the U.S. use something like SketchUp or, or, or Rhino. Both, both tools have a, have a kind of scripting language that gets you into computational par 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 parametric design. So I think that's kind of the introduction level of, of, of doing something that's really programming. Pro pro programming is kind of textual versions of something that, and uh, they're getting more and more automated, so you click, 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 click a couple of, of letters and it and knows what word, word you, you're, you're going to type. So I think it's going to be very easy, but I think some kind of customization, if you want to go down that road at, at all, you, you, you're going to have to do something that looks like coding to somebody. Um, I'm just wondering what kind of mix of students you have in the lab and roughly how many? Yeah, I've got quite a few students. Well, the, the lab has uh, has open kind of requests for proposals, so we get people from civil engineering, mechanical. My, my program is primarily uh, uh, the students are architectural engineers, kind of mixture of both the technology engineering side and, and the art architectural side, and that they're all PhD students that I work, primarily work with. Do you uh, have any knowledge of what the mix of, let's say, what uh, classes some of the undergraduates are taking? They're a good indication of where the industry is going to end up going. Well, they all know that they have to take courses in uh, some level of computer aided design. Many of them take BIM courses. BIM isn't a popular course. It's not mandatory in architecture today, but in the, the studio course, because it, there's a big learning curve on, uh, on, on, for example, a course in Revit or, but, but every student really takes generative components or, uh, or Grasshopper and Rhino, so they, they are getting scripting in technology in, in, input. We're not having enough in terms of get, get integrating analysis program with design program and getting feedback and doing kind of hill climbing or optimization or tuning of your design. It's still the kind of one pass, get an energy analysis, then by hand kind of make, make the adjustment changes. I think that's where the challenge for us really is. That is the actual most interesting bit of it. I'm surprised it isn't more popular. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> questions? Okay, stop that.